Hi, I'm Thomas Bowles, Prince William County Agricultural Extension Agent. Welcome to our video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is 11 o'clock. We're going to get started. My name is Thomas Bowles. I'm the Ag Agent here in Prince William County. Welcome to this week's class on container gardening with native plants. Our speaker today is Nancy Berlin, who is our natural resources specialist here at the Prince William Extension Office. And with that, Nancy, uh, go ahead and take it away. Okay. Thanks for um, inviting me here. Uh, this is the presentation that was presented at our Native Plant Symposium in February, but I did do some, make some modifications to it. So um, it, it's new material too. So I'm impressed that you're inside today. Maybe you're out on your porch looking at this, but it's such a beautiful day. We are um, in the office here. We're wishing we were outside today. So let's get started. I can get my cursor here. Okay. so. Just to define, make sure we're all on the same page, we're going to define a native plant and all the, one, all the plants in this presentation were chosen because they're local to Northern Virginia. So a good source for that is Plant Nova Native's website, excellent resource, or Ursanga's website with, that has local ecotypes, um, with the exception of Echinacea because um, that's a really popular plant. It's not native to Northern Virginia, but um, I included it um, it's be becoming pretty ubiquitous in Northern Virginia. I'll present some information on straight species and cultivars a little bit later. And I put a lot of Latin names in here, not to impress you or to confuse you, but a lot of plants share the same common name. And I wanna make sure that you have an opportunity to purchase the, the plant that um, you expect and, and not, not something that's um, perhaps the wrong plant. So um, because inside you, there are two wolves, one can remember the many Latin binomials and the other one, I, I can't even remember why I went down in the basement to, to do something. So um, this will be recorded um, and you can take notes on it now and you can also look at it again and take notes on it later because I don't expect you to remember. I always tell master gardeners, you don't have to remember everything. It, and isn't that a relief at this age that you don't have to because um, uh, we can depend on uh, many good resources online. So um, this is a bloom time table. Uh, and so I, I try to do these for any landscape design that I put together, uh, planning for, uh, you know, a, a nice uh, bloom time, scattered bloom time. And, and if, if we want to attract pollinators, it gives us a idea of when the nectar source and when cover would be available. This is small, I, I understand that, but you can uh, go for a closer look at Plant Nova Natives and just put in a uh, bloom time table. It, it's, I think it's under their resources. That, that website is full of great information. Here's another bloom time table that is put together by uh, Penn State Pollinator Trials. Uh, and they're one of about four universities that are doing some uh, good research on cultivars versus straight species, um, things that are altered um, or hybridized um, versus uh, their, their availability and their attractiveness to pollinators and native plants, I mean, um, pollinators and native insects. So you can, you can look this up online for a closer look. I know it's too small to see really uh, right now, but um, Penn State, University of Vermont, Mount Cuba, and there's one other university that will probably come to me later. So uh, just a word about cultivars, nativars, and straight species. There's a lot of jargon floating around out there in, in any field these days. But in the botanical field, you'll hear people talking about cultivars, and sometimes they'll use the word nativars, and sometimes I've used the word straight species with you. When in doubt, and you can get a straight species, I, for example, Achillea millifolium is um, yarrow, common yarrow, and it's got a white flower. It doesn't have the, not the yellow, not the pink, many varieties and colors. But Amelia, Achillea millifolium with the single quote mark paprika is a red cultivar. So it, when, when in doubt, um, as a general rule, straight species are more attractive to pollinators and they recognize them more readily, but not always. It's, it's, it's not always uh, easy to predict. And so I'm gonna present uh, a few cultivars, but um, uh, 
like for example, symph Symphonotrichum October Skies. Okay, that that um, that's a, an aster. Uh, it blooms in the fall. It's purple, and the October Skies was substantially better than than the straight species in attracting pollinators. And you know that it's a um, a cultivar because of the single quote mark October Skies, and that was through research at Penn State. But the more hybridized, the less genetic diversity and the less resiliency. And that's from Annie White's uh, PhD dissertation from University of Vermont. Anyway, you can cons consult a reputable source. Mount Cuba has reports on a whole bunch of different native plants. Um, they've done a report on flocks and on hookera and uh, on a whole bunch of uh, baptisia and, and they've you know they've done research on how attractive it was and because we want we're planting native plants for more than just beauty and and they are beautiful but uh we need to take think about the larger uh ecosystem viewpoint so sometimes in uh uh a native R is just a native cultivar. And this is a good, really good example. Here on the left, you have Monarda fistulosa, prolific plant in the mint family, square stem. It's developed over hundreds of years in a particular ecosystem. It covers about a third of my front yard uh, and is filled with pollinators constantly. But there's a native R, which is slightly different and it's Claire Grace, and you can see it's an, you know it's a cultivar, or in this case, we can also use the word native R. It's it's deliberately crossed or hybridized for character uh, desired characteristics. So Claire Grace, little different color, little brighter color, and this uh, particular uh, native R is resistant to powdery mildew, and it's just as attractive to uh, pollinators and beneficial insects. So there's some advantage and disadvantages. So here's the chart that just shows you native species. We wanna be a host to insects and birds. They're well adapted to conditions. And if I'm gonna do a restoration project, you know, and restore a natural area, I'd wanna stick with a straight species because it supports the goal of biodiversity. Sometimes it can be hard to find and, and probably the big box stores and many garden centers may not have what you want as, as far as straight species go. You may need to go to a specialty nursery for native plants. So it depends on, you know, what you're looking for and um, if you're going to be restoring something. Um, it's less predictable because because it's less uniform because there's more genetic diversity. But a native cultivar or a native R um, may have an advantageous property and it may be just as attractive, but it may not. It's more predictable in terms of size, how fast it spreads in terms of color, and it may be disease resistant like that Monarda I just showed you. And it's more commercially available, easier to find. Most garden centers will carry that. And um, if, if the plants are indeed labeled at a big box store with, with the Latin name, that's probably what you're going to find there. But it does lack genetic diversity and it may be less adaptive for like hardiness. Um, and it may be less valuable to wildlife. So just know where, that we're starting from that uh, particular viewpoint. There's more, much more reading on native R's. I've just listed three. Um, you can just Google Mount Cuba uh, cultivars, or I mean, even if you don't remember these exact websites, um, Penn, you could Google Penn State pollinators or, you know, but we want a reputable source. So with the, whenever you do search terms, you can put in at the end of the search terms .ext or .edu to find some reputable sources. So for anything, uh, any garden, you want to, our best practices are uh, right plant, right place. So uh, think about the place. It's fun to think about putting containers in places um, to beautify your landscape. And, but, but think about what the conditions are. Is it kind of warm? Uh, is it, uh, does it get a lot of wind in that space? How much sun does it get? Uh, is it gonna be hard to water it? I have to keep my containers really close to my porch because I get really lazy as the summer gets hotter. You wanna clean any container well. Uh, you can do use diluted bleach and water, uh, one part, 
bleach to 10 parts of water and clean clean with a, a wire or brush or I, I have a scrub brush that I keep to just remove mineral deposits. I Sometimes I leave the mineral deposits on the outside because I like it to look a little bit antique or old, but yeah, it's up to you. It must have adequate drainage holes. I see so many beautiful containers that are you know, priced fairly in stores, but they have no holes in the bottom of them. And some of them are uh, pottery, so you can't really drill a hole. But if it's a plastic container, and we'll talk about choosing a container later, just make sure whichever you pick has a, has adequate drainage holes. We'll talk more about drainage. Uh, choose the container based on the plant's needs, location, and design. A black um, pot, plastic pot on my uh, front porch is not a good thing because it, it absorbs a lot of the heat. And it's really, really hard to keep it um, from, from drooping and, and getting too hot. And a, a clay pot is good for things like herbs, although herbs are not native uh, to Northern Virginia, but um, herbs would like uh, a porous pot that, that the uh, water could, you know, keep it, keep the roots dry. Don't use any rocks or any other filler at the bottom, and I'll show you a picture about why that is. You're just going to have to kind of take it on faith, but there's research that shows that uh, putting anything that uh, changes the soil um, layer to, to a different layer will cause water to accumulate and you get a perched water table. Uh, bring any porous containers in for the winter, and I like to keep track of my plants, my new plants, sometimes by putting them in a pot all season long and then adding the plant to my garden in the fall. That might be something you could consider. Always water the soil and not the plant. You want to keep water off the leaves because that encourages uh, fungal and bacterial diseases if the leaves get wet and stay wet. Watering in the morning is a good idea because then the leaves, if the leaves get a few drips on them that, that you're able to, uh, it's able to dry out during the day. So let's talk about the all important thing. I'm gonna spend probably way too much time on soil, but it's so important. Uh, garden soil, if you're going to have native plants, garden soil can be used. Um, that's not the case if you're going to be growing uh, seedlings or if you're going to be growing uh, vegetables, but we're not going to be talking about that. So we're talking about native plants use native soil. And you can mix it together. And, and the, here's some possible combinations. Uh, one part garden soil, one part core, one part perlite or coarse builder sand, don't use fine beach sand or play sand. And I'll, I'll be a little more specific with that in a few minutes. But garden soil may contain insects, weed, weed seeds, or disease organisms. But as long as it's, um, as, as long as you're monitoring it and, and scouting the plant, and native plants are very resistant to, to um, the insects that might uh, visit them. Avoid peat. Peat is a non-renewable source, and um, it takes hundreds and hundreds of years to develop a peat bog. And we're we're recommending that you not use peat anymore. Many at several garden centers that I visited recently um, ha have peat-free products now, so you can ask for that. And um, and people are becoming more and more aware that that's an option and a good option. Make sure. The soil you select is well drained, and um, we'll talk about that some more. Your plants are dependent on a small volume of soil when the, when it's growing in a container, so you're going to have to provide it with a little more uh, attention than a plant that is in the landscape that can draw from a wider variety and a larger amount of soil. Uh, some soilless mixtures are hydrophobic. This picture here shows uh, water laying right on top of the soil. Is the soil floating and is the water laying on top? So uh, you might want to do a test before you uh, commit to using. There's much more uh, information at the Garden Professor's Container Planning. Uh, this is the name of the article, Intuition Versus Reality. You can read more, probably more than you really want to know. Um, so the, here's the perch water table. If you put rocks or, or styrofoam or anything at the bottom, uh, this creates, a, it's, it, it's not intuitive. To me, you know, all those years of doing this, uh, I, I always 
pictured that the water would drain right through those rocks and out the bottom. But indeed, that is not what happens when the water reaches a, a substrate that is different from the one above it, it collects there and then the roots end up sitting in, in uh, water. And again, it's, it's sort of counterintuitive, uh, but, but you want to avoid that. No roots want to sit in water all the time with the exception of very few plants. Um, so just take my word for it. You can read more if you don't believe me. You can read more at the garden professors. So no peat. So what are you going to use instead? So it's important to see how any components that you pick work together. This is a little more of a, uh, a instead of a prescriptive presentation, you're going to have to be a little more investigative. Okay, so uh, there's lots of variety in the products of potting soil that are out there. So you want to test the drainage for yourself. Compost, soils, bark ingredients change over time. They break down and that can affect root growth. Perlite or builder stand, sand are stable and they break down slowly, but you don't want to use them exclusively. You want to mix them. Many ingredients, again, are hydrophobic. So watch how your soil works when you put water on it. Uh, they need to be moistened well before planting. And if you allow, allow some ingredients to dry out, they become hydrophobic and won't absorb soil. Remember, good soil, even in the pot, has about 50% air. So look at the potting mix. Does it look okay? I always smell it. I bought some potting soil once and it smelled like petroleum. But look at it. Um, see if you can look at samples of it. Is the particle size about right? And you can develop a standard. Um, this is, you don't have to do this experiment yourself, but North Carolina Substrate Laboratory, yes, they have a substrate la laboratory to talk to you about soils. And um, uh, they, they filled up 10 pots and they tapped it three times and then they hand irrigate it. And what you're looking for is it to be able to drain in about 30 minutes. So they weighed all their pots and calculated and they use that average of making some recommendations. So here's some soilless medium uh, that were grown by North Carolina State and, and there's one on the left. And um, it's a peat-free mix on the left is what we're, we're steering you toward and a peat perlite mix on the right. So if you don't think that you can do without peat, um, you can certainly um, see from this that the plants are healthy, the root system is just is adequate, and um, you can read more about that if you want to at this link right here. So here's a, here's a soil recipe because, you know, prescriptive is good because it's all floating around in your mind and but I, this is what i use but this is for native plants okay so um you might want to reconsider for any container gardening with um you know vegetables or annuals uh so garden soil perlite builder sand and core maybe instead of peat so you can mix all these together but again you're you're the final judge is it draining properly and is uh, in about 30 minutes and is is there any hydro, hydrophobic or uh, hydrophobic just means fear of water so is there any hydro, hydrophobic tendency of the the mixture that you put together uh, here's some another breakdown i told you there's a lot about soils in here here's some um some possible uh things that you might find in soil mix potting soil mixes uh you still can find peat and sphagnum and again it's not renewable uh you can see find core or uh, coconut fiber that and and that drains well it can be a little hydrophobic without a mixture of something else um, manure is not recommended for containers, uh, forest products, a lot of potting soils, uh, the cheaper ones and mass marketed are made from forest products and it may be pallets, ground up pallets, sawmill waste, and um, may have toxins in it. So uh, be careful of that. Biosolids are just treated human waste. There's some, com some commercial products out there and I wouldn't recommend those. Um, Pine or hardwood mulch, not really useful in a container unless it's a huge container that you're having trouble uh, getting weeded. And fungal inoculants um, like mycorrhizal fungi, the beneficial fungi you find in soil is, is often accompanied in, in a natural environment in the roots of native plants. Uh, but purchasing that is uh, 
probably not beneficial um, because it, it's an additional cost. And again, the, the mycorrhizal fungus are, um, they may not even be alive or active anymore. So uh, if, you, if you're using soil uh, from, from, from your, maybe your woods, uh, some garden soil, uh, it, it will probably have some of those associations with the fungus in the soil already. Fertilizer, so remember, you've got a contained system here. Um, and, and it can't draw nitrogen from uh, a landscape bed. It, it only has what you've given it. So you will probably need to use a little bit of fertilizer, um, organic or conventional. I usually um, just monitor the plants and, and add it to, to um, the water when I'm watering in them. Micronutrients usually aren't necessary. Lime, it's probably all already in the potting soil or the native soil is probably a, the right acidity for native plants. Um, plants that like lean, dry soil, like um, volcanic crock, but we're not going to be talking about that here because we don't live in that zone. We live in zone uh, four, 7A and B. And compost can vary widely. It can contain pathogens. It, um, I, I sometimes will add a little bit of um, uh, my compost to the, to the, um, to the container. Again, I always do a smell test. It can smell of ammonia, some bag soil, smell of petroleum or, or um, wood. So let's talk about maintenance. I think that's probably enough for soils. We're probably done with that topic. Um, I, I would recommend uh, watering in the morning. Uh, if it's drooping in the morning, it does need water. If it's drooping in the afternoon, hey, we all droop in the afternoon. Check the soil. Um, and um, and it probably doesn't need uh, watering if, if it um, droops in the morning. If you have it in a really hot, full sun area, it may need watering a couple times a day. Uh, but the earlier in the day that you can do the waterings, the better because um, then the plants, the leaves have a chance to dry out. Remember, water the soil, not the, not the leaves. Choose the container based on the water needs. Remember, clay will, is porous or ceramic is more porous and allows the roots to stay drier. So knowing what your plant wants um, when you pick it is important. Uh, I said that other water the soil, not the plant. And the more roots, the more water. So if you have a tree in a in a container, uh, the roots get closer to the sides and more profuse. So uh, you probably will need to water it a little bit more. But you can monitor it if it's drooping in the morning. If the, the soil looks exceptionally dry, then you probably need some water. So for potting soil, oh, we're back to the soil a little bit. <laughs> so for water retention, you want something in between too wet and too and fat, too fast draining. If the if the um, soil is pulling away from the sides of the pot and the soil is very compacted and dry, that's too fast draining. And you can see these are clay pots here. This is a rhododendron, and it looks like it's drooping because it needs water. But indeed, this rhododendron is too wet. Not that I would put a rhododendron in a in a container, but the, it's developed a root rot because it was too wet. So you want a sweet spot. So, you know, pick, pick your soil combination and recipe based on what drains well. Here's a, another uh, thing about soil moisture. You, you can go from saturation to permanent wilting point at the, at the point of permanent wilting point, the plant won't recover. And we've all come home to a, a plant that was um, from vacation that was uh, probably uh, at wilting point and, and maybe we could revive it. But a, a after a certain point, you can't uh, revive it because it gets to the, it, the, the water becomes unavailable. Uh, the vascular system won't allow it to take it up. So in the, now we're going to look at some combinations of plants and some different um, situations where we might want to put uh, native plants in a pot. Uh, and if you see this drop, it will re require moist conditions. If you see this, it takes full sun, and that means six plus hours. And may again, when if it's really hot, it might need irrigation. So count the cost of that on your energy level. And if partial sun is less than six hours, and shade, we all know what shade is. <laughs> okay, so container garden, remember, has a finite amount of nutrients. If it dries out, it can't use the fertilizer. So you can use. Uh, they may need 
regular fertilization in order to get good development, but too much nitrogen will develop too much leaf growth and not enough blooms. So, so follow the label directions. I use an organic liquid fertilizer for mine. Um, and sometimes I get lazy and don't, um, don't measure. And um, I'm always sorry that I didn't because um, then it will sit on top and, and you can over fertilize. So uh, the three th formulations that you need are N, P, and K. You don't need any of the micronutrients really. And just follow recommendations on the fertilizer label. There's lots of organic and uh, conventional fertilizers available on the market. So choosing a container. Um, so there's better growth if a plant has more root area to grow, but you can have a plant that's too big. I mean, a, a container that's too big for a certain plant. Um, and you'll get more above ground, ground growth if you have a larger root zone. So maybe you pot up the plant in a small container quickly and then move them to their final destination, which is a larger pot. Um, so you can re read a little bit more about potting up in the correct pot size on uh, Garden Myths. Um, <clears throat> at the garden professors. So there's lots of different containers and I've always wanted one of these troughs. I'm not sure I can keep up with it, but, and there's grow bags and there's little wheelbarrows. There's so many creative things that you can use. There's ceramic, clay and plastic. Again, plastic holds the water in a little bit better, which may or may not be a, a good idea for certain plants. Uh, here's some creative ideas. Um, there's a million out there on Pinterest or Google uh, to, and I, I've, I've tried these. Um, these are drain, uh, drain tiles is what they call them. And I, I've sunk them into the ground and mine are made out of clay. I'm not sure what these are made out of. And they kind of weather nicely and I've got some succulents and some uh, native onions in mine. So beware of where you put them. Uh, this is a microclimate here, and you can see there's not native plants in here. It looks like there's mostly succulents, but that's, an, that's a good place for that because that's a porous container, and it's right against concrete, so it's going to be hotter because that, that cl little climate there you've created is going to be warmer and hotter and drier. Oh, more, hotter and drier. Uh, so watch the angle of the sun and see how much sun you're actually getting. And, and right now the trees are beginning to leaf out. So you're going to get a little more shade in some places where you have woods or, or trees. So when you plant, you're going to remove the pot from its container and inspect the roots. Um, they should look white and healthy. They shouldn't have an odd smell. Uh, remember, your container has to have drain holes. Add the medium that you make. Um, for the native plants and make sure that it has some kind of fertilizer, uh, an organic fertilizer, right when you plant it. And I, you can see they're loosening up the, the roots here so that, uh, because that was kind of root bound uh, and many, many container plants that you buy at nurseries are gonna be, need to have their, um, their roots uh, loosened up. So here's some design considerations. Um, and, uh, We'll go through each one of these. So um, the, if you've done any container gardening or you've watched any tutorials, you know the acronym of thrill, fill, and spill. And so the thrill is the one, the plant that sticks up in the middle and the fill is fills up the pot to make it look full and the spill spills over the side. That's just one design option. And you're not, don't be tied to that, um, but it's an option. So let's talk about colors. Analogous colors would be hot colors or warm colors, colors in the same kind of the same um, area of the color wheel. Here, here's, here's one combination here, and these could handle partial sun. Here's a, uh, these are all native Northern Virginia plants, Packer aria is starting to bloom now. It's got cool purple buds in the spring before it develops these bright yellow flowers. It likes some shade though, and columbine and with the yellow uh, stamens and zizia. So these, these are kind of the warm color palette. Uh, here's some analogous colors that are in the blues and lavenders, and these are natives. Penstemon digitalis, it has that little purple nectar guide, iris cristata, and here's the native bleeding heart, dicentrexemia, and here's the geranium maculatum, which I 
have never been able to grow very well, but it's lots of people do it successfully. But if you want kind of a cool, um, restful uh, garden, and these can handle partial sun uh, too. So remember your color chart. And, and if you put things that are complementary, uh, they're the ones that are across from each other on the color wheel. Just a quick reminder, orange and, orange and green and green and purple and yellow and blue. I'm designing a garden for a friend of mine now, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask her to paint her fence where she'll have the container gardens behind it, uh, like a, a royal blue or a, a bright blue, so that we can put some yellow plants in front of that and really make them pop. So here's, here's, some, um, here's that color combination, the Sisyncrium and the Zizia. This is blue-eyed grass and um, Golden Alexander. Uh, they would look, they, and these are, these can both handle some sun uh, or green and the orange, the Lilium Superbum or, and Carex uh, Pennsylvanica. This is the, the uh, Turk's Cap Lily is such a dramatic plant that I think that putting uh, Carex Pennsylvanica around the bottom of it would make a nice foil for that drama and it would fill up the pot uh, nicely and keep the weeds down. Uh, Carex is just a sedge, and these would handle partial sun. So let's talk about full sun in the spring. Some more eye candy here. Um, this is a combination that I've used. Um, Achillea millifolium with the ferny-like um, uh, foliage. Uh, and there's the flower of the Achillea millifolium. That's just yarrow, common yarrow. And the, and the Cisyncrium angustifolium, which is blue-eyed grass. And then Azizia aurea or the um, Golden Alexander. So that would be one easy combination that can handle some sun. There's another combination for sun uh, to partial sun, Aquilegia, that's the native columbine, Iris cristata, and Carex pensylvanica again. Um, and there's the little flower heads of, the, of this, uh, that native sedge, um, Pennsylvania sedge. Another co color combination, these just make me drool. These make me want to go out and plant all my containers um, if, I, if I can ever get out of the garden. Here's, a, a, here's that uh, Pacara aria again. That's the golden ragwort. Uh, and here's the buds of the golden ragwort. That's what they look like before they bloom. So you're, and they have basil leaves that are evergreen. All, they stay green all winter. So it's a, it's a wonderful plant that has a lot of different um, attributes. And then Penstem and Digitalis, it can pick up on that purple uh, stem with the white flower with the purple nectar guides. And then this is the um, a native strawberry, Fragaria virginiana, which makes a great ground cover in that pot uh, and really, really brings in pollinators. This is an early spring. Um, these are all all emerging in my yard right about now or next week. So Tiarella or foam flower, and it has it has that beautiful white bloom, but it also has uh, mottled leaves that are really pretty. And the Achillea millifolium, which can handle sun or shade, and Phlox severicata. So these are all partial sun um, plants, and they're all going to be blooming about maybe in another week to two. Um, and so that. Um, I think this just, I love the texture combination here. So let's talk about full sun and early summer. So now we're thinking ahead. And uh, if we didn't get anything planted in our, um, in our beds uh, in the spring, we can think ahead to this. So there's that uh, uh, native columbine again. And look at this, uh, Spidelia is dramatic plant. It could be the thriller. And Coreopsis for just a lot of, or the threadleaf um, Coreopsis. And then, of course, I put my favorite, Pennsylvania sedge. So these can all handle partial to full sun. Uh, this is a partridge pea. It's an annual, a native annual. It reseeds readily, so be, be ready for that. And a Rebecca, these are all full sun, Asclepius tuberosa. This is one of those analogous hot combinations and um, that will bring, bring lots of visitors to your yard. So full sun in midsummer, um, Leatra spicata. Uh, and then here we have the um, complementary colors uh, and Rubecchia fulgita, um, the orange coneflower. 
Um, here's another color combination. Uh, there, the yarrow is back. Can you tell I like yarrow? <laughs> and then the helenium. Uh, it, these all like a little bit more water. That helenium likes a little bit more water. And it's the, this is uh, called sneeze weed. Doesn't make you sneeze. It has something to do with snuff. And I can't remember what the story is. And then there's this panicum, which is a, a native grass. And this is a this is a cultivar called Shenandoah. And that could be your thriller. And then Rebecca Fulgita. And here's the arrow again with the foliage. Here's here's a um, this is taken from Thomas Rainier, uh, pink muley grass. And I, I love pink muley grass, but it tends to look a little bit scraggly until it's ready to bloom. And then it looks beautiful. But down the bottom, it can be a little bit messy looking at the bottom. So Thomas Rainier, this is his design at, uh, you, oh, excuse me, you, United States Botanic Gardens. And he used um, a cultivar of uh, sunflower, uh, the native sunflower, Angustifolius, and, and it was called Lowdown. And uh, uh, I can't verify that it's perfect for pollinators, but he, I trust his judgment. And he puts this in so that the uh, Helianthus will, you know, catch your attention but and it but it hides the um purple the pink muley grasses uh roots and when it gets ugly there's still something there to to look at which i thought was a brilliant combination here's uh, another full sun for summer you have the muley grass and the rebecca herda here uh again i put the yarrow back in i really like hero um here's another one coreopsis for tisolata and there's that purple cone flower and the asclepius tuberosa this is a pretty dramatic uh, color combination. Another color combination that's complementary. Uh, we have the yellow Coreopsis for Tisolata. And here's another Carex. Uh, and it could be shaded by the beauty berry. This beauty berry, an American beauty berry here is a shrub. So you need a big pot for this. And then this could be at the base and the shade of the Calicarpa. And these could be on the sides getting a little more sun. Here's another shrub for a, for a container. This is a New Jersey tea, Ceonanthus americanus. And you could put this at the base to fill the pot. Uh, this could be the thriller, the filler. And, the, and this, eh, this doesn't really spill, but I think it, it adds an, a little bit of pop. And Coriabasis for Tisolata has a really long bloom time. Here's a few for full sun. Oh, excuse me. Full sun, late summer to early fall. There's that sneeze weed again. And here's a... Uh, Solidago uh, nemoralis, and uh, if you put, pair it with that October Skies uh, aster, then you get a, that complementary color combination. Sneezeweed does need quite a bit of water, especially to establish it, but these other two are pretty drought tolerant. So I haven't tried this combination, but I think I'd like to. Here's a, a, a Tia virginica, which is a native shrub. You can get a small cultivar that doesn't seem to change uh, the flower shape or the leaf color. This is its fall color. And you can put the sedges at the bottom and this is what the bloom's like. And that's that bloom is late spring, early summer. And then you have the fall color uh, so that it, it has a lo some longevity. Uh, Pignanthemum tenifolium, Leatris. Um, this is Veronicastrum virginicum and Leatris pelosa. Um, these are all uh, dramatic plants that are kind of tall. They would need a big pot. This uh, is one of my favorite plants. It looks like a ballet dancer when it comes up, and it's just so delicate and beautiful. And then this um, alongside of it, I think, would make a nice color combination. Here's another color combination with that um, pink muley grass and brings out the pink and the echinacea and rebecca. Here's a, a different type of mountain mint. Pignanthemum muticum. It's prolific in the landscape. So if you put it in a pot, you can kind of contain its growth a little. And these are both in the fall. These are both blooming and very active with pollinators. So there's the um, New England aster, uh, which would be good pairing for fall. Here's a few for the spring. I think we did most of these. These are, this is a little bit more of a close up. We did those. Okay, so some ferns, Pacara aria paired with um, maidenhair fern, Robin's favorite fern, uh, part sun, early summer. These like a little bit more wet, hookera. So this is the flower of the hookera. Not very dramatic, but gives you a nice spike. And the mottled leaves, 
And then there's that um, Coreopsis verticillata. I like I like that. That's a one tough plant. And then uh, pick Carex pensylvanica to fill the pot again. And then perhaps add another um, another um, fern to the bottom. This is a uh, green and gold. It's a ground, kind of a ground cover and pairing that with um, Solomon seal and a, a fern, a marginal shield fern. Um, and this does like a little bit wet, so wet and some shade. Here's a wonderful com combination if you can keep deer out of your yard. Uh, although I like the way they have this here. This is ostrich ferns. And I don't think that, that the deer will venture in there quite as readily, but these are the um, impatience capensis. It's the jewel weed, spotted jewel weed. And I think that um, I might try that with the uh, ostrich fern around there to kind of protect it because the deer really took it a liking to my uh, jewel weed, which is beautiful. And this likes moist and, and a little bit of shade. There's a few more combinations. This is uh, staghorn sumac, great fall color, interesting bloom and seed head. And then uh, this is a, a Carex second handle uh, part shade underneath the, the shrub. So this would need a very big pot. These are uh, moist plants for partial sun. Uh, this is blue, blue mist flower here. And then um, there's another uh, sedge. And this is Lobelia sylvatica or uh, great blue Lobelia. These all like moist partial sun. Uh, Aragrostis is another wonderful native grass. It's kind of purpley and pairing it with this turtle head, which is a very sweet native plant. Looks like a turtle is opening his mouth. Um, could be a good combination. This is a sedum, that native sedum that likes the shade. It can handle a little bit of sun, but look how cute it is. Um, I, I just, I like it even when it's not blooming, but this is the bloom and they're just getting ready in my yard to bloom. And um, pairing that with us with a Carex that's kind of spiky, uh, could make for an interesting partial sun wet uh, pot that would, you would need to have in the shade and keep moist. You can also do vines and you can put a trellis on if you want. Uh, Lonicera semper virens makes a good vine to put in a pot. Um, here's some interesting trellis ideas. Um, there's real, some really cool things made out of um, sticks um, that it, with a little bit of time and know-how you could pull together. So you could do single species like witch hazel in a pot. Uh, I would move it out into the landscape uh, probably at some point to allow it to, um, to thrive better. Uh, Calicarpa, here's the American beautyberry. That could be in a pot. Yucca is a native plant that doesn't look like a, a native plant. It looks like it's tropical to me. It's pollinated by moss, blooms in June and July. It likes full, sun, full to part sun, but it could be an interesting uh, plant in a pot. I love this. I saw this at the Mosaic District up in Fairfax, and these are uh, horsetails. They like really wet soil. I've always wanted to, to plant this. Uh, it can handle some shade, uh, and they're better in a pot because they, uh, they can be kind of aggressive. You know, we don't say native plants are um, uh, invasive. We say they're a little aggressive. Uh, you could put an, a tea in a pot, the, the um, Virginia Sweet Spire or button bush, as long as you can keep it wet enough and put it in, a, in the right spot in some partial shade. Sugar Shack is a smaller uh, button bush that could go in a pot more, more easily than the full. And I try not to think of this as looking like the coronavirus, but <laughs> it always reminds you of that, but it's a, it's a beautiful bloom that many pollinators like. So here's a, here's a few lists. If you want to look at this later, this might be the slide that you might want to start with to consider some combinations. And here's the ones for part sun. And for winter interest, you could put a red twig dogwood. Uh, we have a couple of master gardeners that have done some beautiful containers for winter uh, with red twig dogwood or this American hazelnut has these catkins that are uh, really interesting. Ilex verticillata or the uh, winterberry holly. Um, is, is it would, would work in a container as long as you could keep it wet and in the right sun conditions, but I would want to move it out into the landscape later if you could. 
So I just included this, um, this, and these are none of these are natives here. But if you are on Instagram, you ought to follow Klaus Dalby. He's from Denmark, and what I like is that he groups his containers together. And if you can find plants that are, are monochromatic or blend together nicely, you could substitute in native plants for a display like this. I mean. This is kind of over the top, you know, I don't have an estate like this, but I, I just thought for inspiration, you could and certainly uh, take his idea and use natives instead. I want to remind you that you, if you have containers, you can still qualify for an Audubon at home site visit with Mar Prince William Master Gardeners. You can email us and we can tell you how to go about signing up. We're not there to judge your plants. We're there to help you to make some uh, wise decisions and maybe give you some plant recommendations to see if you can attract birds and other wildlife to your yard. We don't tell you how to get deer because I think that's probably a given, right? Um, but these are the Audubon sanctuary species that, we're, that we um, want to attract. So planting for these critters is uh, some kind of a goal of a site visit from a master gardener. And, uh, but, and let us know if we can, if we can do that for you. We also have a, a fantastic team of master gardeners that, that staffs the Extension Horticulture Help Desk. We're happy to answer questions about your lawn, landscape, plant, insect problems. If you need a plant identified, it's staffed weekdays and you can just email us a picture or a question and we're happy to help you. We're also on social media. We have a great teaching garden blog that's featuring favorite tools of master gardeners. And we have, we're on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest. And we also have a master gardeners of Prince William website. So uh, join us there. There's a lot of great discussion about problem solving and, and, and upcoming research and best practices. These are some of the resources that I've used. Um, there's a lot of native plant sales coming up. Plant Nova Natives has a listing of the native plant sales that are uh, in April and May so, and June. So you might want to check that out, Prince William Wildflower Society. And Master Gardeners will both have plant sales. Uh, Master Gardeners is in May. Can you put the date in, Robin? I think it's May. Um, and yes. Prince William Wildflower Society has theirs on Mother's Day, uh, Saturday. Okay, and this is Hookara with some ferns. That's a pretty simple one, and I'm, I'm willing to entertain any questions. Well, that was fantastic, Nancy. It just so happens I'm going container sh garden shopping today, so I've got some <laughs> great ideas. So it's inspiring. The help desk has answered a number of questions. One was, is it okay to use vinegar blend instead of bleach, but um, vinegar is not as effective as bleach. Correct. Um, can you use hydrogen peroxide? And um, they, um, she answered that also. It's not as terribly effective. It depends um, on the yeah. The roots winding around the pot makes me hope you will discuss air pruning and using grow bags. Uh, well, whenever I, you're absolutely right. And that's going to be a problem with any nursery grown plant, unless you get a bare root tree. Whenever I get a plant, um, any kind, I, I take it out of the pot and I loosen the soil. So it's um, like a, the sun rays all around it and I spread them out in the pot and make sure I have the, the right pot so it's not going to go back into a container where it's going to circle again um, and and make sure that it has lots of room and that the, the soil uh, will allow good drainage too. I might even, I, and I've, I will cut roots, you know, and score it all the way around to make sure that the roots have uh, the ability to spread out themselves. Um, that is just a problem with any commercial plants that you that you buy. Unless, I mean, I, I mean, I've gone to uh, some plant sales and some native plant vendors that um, that 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 wasn't the case, but it's it's unusual to find and to include uh, trees and shrubs. And absolutely, we have. Um, proper planting video on our YouTube channel, which we I posted, but also the uh, garden professors 
mm-hmm. blog and that website was also um, included in the chat. So whenever I plant a tree or shrub, I root wash it so I can see where the roots are, what needs to be cut. So I take all the soil off, hose it down. Uh, and that may, you know, that may be more than you can handle. <laughs> but, but that is, and that is not what a, what, um, a commercial landscaper is probably going to do. You want to take off all the baskets and the wire and everything, burlap. Uh, and, uh, but that's what I do because I, I I don't have a lot of extra money to be continually replacing things. And a tree that is planted improperly will have a a premature death, usually 10 years uh, for for urban trees. So, you know, making sure it's planted correctly and the roots are um, open and and, um, able to get nutrients is, is critically important. Um, and especially if you buy perennials at the sale tables, which many of us do, they're often very root bound. So if they've been in the pot, maybe two or three years. That's right. Um, will these slides be available um, as we posted our YouTube channel? You can watch probably by Friday and then you can stop it to write down the names. Because it was a lot. It yeah. was a lot. Don't, don't be intimidated by the Latin names, but use them as a tool. Okay. Mm-hmm. And 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 rewatch it, or you can call the help. You know, you can email the help desk if you have a specific question too. Is untreated charcoal, aka a biochar, for instance, what is left over from burning hunks of invasive trees we've removed, such as Bradford pear, useful as an addition? I would. I don't think I'd use it in a pot. I don't have any data for that right right here. With you know, handy with me, you might want to Google biochar native if I, plants. If, if I can jump in real quick, sure. Um, in a potted situation, biochar is pretty much useless um, because the advantage of biochar is really the carbon content and focusing with microorganisms, um, and you don't really have that going on in in most potting situations. Uh, also, the research is kind of shaky on, on just exactly how well biochar works mm-hmm. as an additive. So, yeah, I w- it's not necessarily going to hurt, but it's not necessarily going to help it either. And when you've got a contained system, you know, you want to make sure that you're using something that will help. Thank you, Thomas. Thomas is up on a lot of these things that I'm not up on. Can I use water from our fish pond instead of commercial fertilizer? It's hard to predict what the nutrient content of that would be, Thomas. I, I mean, I, I, I would use yeah. something that you knew the formulation because otherwise you're just guessing. Do you have anything to add, Thomas? Yeah, it's, it's always tricky. Um, assuming, well, there, there are two issues. If you're using water from the pond to water your, your plants, you're using that water, reusing it, but that you still have to refill the pond and you have to be careful about doing that um, to make sure there's enough dissolved oxygen in the water for the fish that you have. Uh, Water from a pond is going to be, relatively speaking, um, lower in nutrients than a lot of of, uh, commercial fertilizers, but so you're probably not going to burn your plants but it is going to be a little bit more challenging. Also, you don't have the biology in the container that's going to take the, the um, what's the word I'm thinking of, the organic forms of, mm-hmm. of nitrogen and convert them into the inorganic forms that plants can uptake. Great. Good. When shopping at a garden center, is there a way that you can check without mauling the plant if it is uh, pot bound? You can assume that it is pot bound yeah. and that you're going to have to just remedy that by bringing it home and loosening the roots and, and you know, spreading them out uh, and giving it a chance to maybe scoring it too. So you can assume that it's going to be that way. I have found that to be true, especially of grasses. Yes. Because they have. uh, Can trumpet vine be grown in a grow bag in hopes the roots will air prune with a trellis or two tier for it to grow up? That is a great idea because (laughs) otherwise you're going to be, you know, it's 
it's really aggressive. So I would put it in a container with a trellis is a great idea. Anything, you know, in the mint family would be good in a container too, if you need to, you know, limit its growth a bit. It will still, it will still spread around your yard, but it's a beautiful plant. Okay. Um, is there a chart somewhere of how deep a container should be to accommodate the roots of a particular natives? Well, if you've got a, if you've got a tree that you're planting, remember that there's a flare at the bottom and that, that flare is usually hidden in container grown pots at garden centers. So if you look at a tree, the way a kid would draw a tree with that flare down the bottom, that should always be above the soil line. So you wanna pick a pot that will allow you to do that because if you, you plant that below the soil line, it's gonna be more uh, uh, prone to disease and it's gonna be stressed. It's not gonna use water or nutrients as well. So that just, for the tree or shrub, make sure that flare is above the soil line. And then if it's a, just a, a perennial, uh, take a look at how big the root ball is and, and um, make it a, you know, a couple times bigger than the root ball, um, uh, I think would be a good general rule. And so true because the root flare being buried is one of the biggest problems with landscape trees improperly planted. Carla asks, where is, I'm um, saying this right, C-O-I-R C -O -I -R available? I miss or, or. Uh, most garden centers will have it. Um, and even, I, I've even seen it at like box stores. Um, and, and again, some garden centers have started carrying products that are peat free and likely they will have core, uh, which is just coconut fiber. Uh, mm -hmm. I see. How do you score the roots? So I take the, I wish I could use my hands to show you this. <laughs> you just take it out of the pot and you, I, I take a, like, actually, I, I use a steak knife, an old steak knife, because I don't have to answer to anybody that uses that. <laughs> and I just cut uh, maybe at 12, um, 3, 6, and 9, and then see if I can spread the roots from there, run some water over it. Um, you know, you don't have to mash all the roots up, but I would score it maybe, you know, as much as you need to, um, to get the roots to spread out a bit in the pot. I think that's it. Any more questions? Well, that was fantastic, Nancy. Thank you. Oh, Great thank ideas. you. For, thank you for coming. Yeah. yeah. And, um, I think that's it. No more questions. All right. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming by, and thank you, Nancy, for pre presenting, and we will see you all next time.